Welcome to ECE 303. Our first lab deals with the introduction of the oscilloscope, function generator, and digital multimeter. An oscilloscope, or just scope in general, is a device that can measure voltage versus time. The scope that we're using in lab is called a two-channel digital storage scope. By two channels, we mean we can measure two different voltages at the same time. Digital storage means that our measured voltage is converted to a series of binary numbers which are then stored in memory and then converted so we can display them on a monitor. What's shown on the next page is a screen capture of a function generator hooked up to the oscilloscope and set to a 6 volt 1 kilohertz sine wave. This little ground symbol here refers to where the zero volt reference is. So everything above this point is positive, everything below it is negative. So here we've got one division, two division, three divisions above ground, and the scale is two volts per division. So it's going to give us six volts. Likewise, this would be minus two, minus four, minus six. So indeed it is a six volt peak sine wave. Now if we calculate the period here, we've got one division, two divisions, three divisions, four divisions, five divisions, and the x-axis is 200 microseconds per division. So that's going to give us 1,000 microseconds, which is one millisecond, and the reciprocal of that is one kilohertz. So indeed we have a six volt, one kilohertz sine wave. We're building quite a few circuits in lab, and we're going to use a variety of components, one of which is a resistor. And resistors are encoded with a series of painted bands. Uh, many have four bands of color. And those colors are associated with its value. Colors go from black through white, indicating a numerical value associated with that color. And then there's also a color associated with the tolerance of the resistor. The bands are really placeholders. If you position the resistors such that the bands are to the left-hand side, then the first band is the position holder here, second band, and then third band. And then tolerance, which is the fourth band, represents a range of values. Let's just do an example. It would be easier to explain this. Suppose that we have a red, violet, yellow, gold resistor. If you look up above here, you can see that red is 2, violet squeezing here is 7, and yellow is equal to 4. That's going to give you 27 times 10 to the 4th ohms, or really 270 k ohms if we talk about engineering notation. And the gold band uh, in the fourth place is indicative of a 5% tolerance. So what that means is that on the average we'll have a value of 270,000 ohms, but we could have 5% higher to 5% lower, and really anything in between. In this case that would correspond at 256.5 k ohms as the low, and 283.5 as the high. So our resistor would be somewhere between those two limits. It would be nice to know more precisely what's the value of our components if we're trying to do a precision measurement. We have a meter in lab that's capable of doing this that measures voltage, current, and also resistance uh, made by the Fluke Manufacturing Company. One technique for measuring resistance is what's called a two-wire resistance measurement. And it might be easier just to show you a little drawing here as to what's going on with the instrument itself. Inside of it is a current source that's set up to flow through whatever's hooked up to it. Now there's a voltmeter across the terminals and a little bit of current goes in here, but the voltmeter has resistance in the order of thousands of mega ohms. So most of this current will go through the wires, through the sample, and then back to the current source. Suppose we hooked up a red wire and a black wire. Okay, what are we actually measuring with the meter? Let's take a little equivalent circuit representation of this. So here we've got our current source and we're measuring back across those two terminals, but what's hooked up is a wire, a sample, and a return wire. And every piece of wire has some resistance associated with it. So really what we've got here is a rise in voltage equals a drop across, say the red wire, drop across the sample, and drop across the black wire. But what's common is the current I. So you pull that out, and so the ratio of the voltage to current would be really the input resistance of this circuit, which is really the sum of the red wire's resistance, the black wire's resistance, and the unknown. The value of the wire resistance is pretty low. 
In most cases, it's negligible compared to the value that we're measuring. So in that case, really what we see on the display is, is roughly the value of the resistance. But, but what kind of numbers are we talking about here? Well, for the wires in lab, they're around 50 milliohms, but there are some that are thinner, shorter, that could be as high as maybe half an ohm. So uh, if we are measuring things in the 1,000 ohm range, these would be uh, insignificant when added to the value that's here. What if you did have a small resistor, something maybe in a 1 to 10 ohm range, where the wire resistance would be a significant part of it? Well, one way is just to measure the wire itself and then subtract off that from whatever reading you have. But there is another feature in the instrument that allows you to do that a little quicker. And that is by bringing out a second pair of wires to put across the sample. So what we've got here is our current going again through the wire, through the sample, back through the wire but now we're going to measure the voltage across the resistor. Now again, the, the meter has a very high resistance, again, on the order of thousands of mega ohms, so that's going to be in parallel with this, and that would change the value slightly. So really what we've got is the same equivalent circuit, except that we're measuring this voltage now instead of this voltage. So we are getting the true value of the resistor. Well, just like the resistor has a tolerance, uh, the instrument itself has a tolerance also. Our meter is said to be a five and a half digit multimeter. And what that means is that five of the digits can go from zero to nine, and one of the digits, uh, in this case, goes from zero to one, in a sense being a half digit, uh, maybe in a digital sense, not the full range of values. On the 20k ohm range, uh, the manufacturer lists the accuracy of the instrument as 0.0028% of the reading plus two digits, what we call two counts. Okay, so what does all that mean? Well, let's just do an example. Suppose that I am on, on the 20k ohm range, and I can read up to uh, actually 19.9999k ohms. So it's possible to have a reading of 13.3413k. If we take 0.0028% of this reading, that means throw two more zeros in here, we get this result. Now it says to add to that two digits, so we take all the places that are here, put all zeros in them, and put a two. In this case would be the last place here with a two in it. It does have units of K, so we've got to keep that along, but if you had an accuracy of uh, eight digits, you'd put an eight here instead of a two. If you had an accuracy of 13 digits, you'd put a one three here. Now when you add these two together, the value you get then is added and subtracted from the reading. Here I'm adding it, here I'm subtracting it. And so what they're saying is that that reading we looked at is really somewhere between this number and this number. So it's a much tighter range than the 5% tolerance on the resistor. If you look at both these numbers, the first four digits are identical. So I can be assured that at least I have this much accuracy in my reading. Let me go back up to the previous page just for a second here. If you were to take a reading and have a lot of leading zeros here, and let's put this on a megohm scale where this would push this back three places, this number would get smaller, but this stays the same. So this becomes a really a minimum error. And so you want to have the least number of leading zeros here so that you get the, the lowest um, variation in, in range from max to min. I also did another example here with a different reading. Assume that we're on the same scale with the same accuracy. I found that the range was between here and here. I'm going to turn this in, but you may want to just try another example to see if you can get the same result. In lab, we're going to use a variety of wires and connectors, uh, one of which, or the majority of which, are going to be called BNC connectors and BNC wires. The BNC cable consists of a plastic jacket, and then it's covering up actually a braid, an enclosement of the actual wire in the center, which is separated from that braid with an insulator. Really what we've got is an inner wire and then an outer shield, and usually we're grounding the outer shield. It's sort of like forming a, a Faraday cage. It's a, it's a solid box that's very hard for extraneous signals to get in. And so when we make connections, we want to make sure that that sleeve, in a sense, is preserved. And that's what these connectors do. They allow you to interlock them and literally encase that little wire with another piece of metal. So then extraneous signals can't get into the wire. We've also been using banana wires for low-frequency connections. We don't have to worry about 
that type of behavior problem. Sometimes you want to grab onto a wire or a connector, and so we have a banana to grabber wire. Or if you don't have a grabber, you can also put a little alligator clip onto the end of one of these things and let you take a low frequency measurement. These B and C connectors actually are very good even up into the gigahertz range. Lastly, we're also going to be using probes to measure voltages in our circuits. This is the equivalent circuit of the Agilent 10073C probe, which are on our oscilloscopes. As we talked about in 203, uh, this is the equivalent circuit of the oscilloscope probe. In the tip itself, there's a 2 megaohm resistor and a 20 picofarad capacitor. The cable itself is around 3 feet long. There's about 10 picofarads per foot of capacitance associated with that cable. And then at the interface to the scope, there's a little set screw that you can vary, but what's inside there is a resistor and a capacitor. The capacitor actually can be varied over a small range of values. And then the oscilloscope itself has an equivalent circuit of about 1 megaohm and 8 picofarads. This configuration, as we talked about in 203, and in fact did an experiment where we actually built a, a pseudo probe, forms a balanced bridge where I've got a resistive voltage divider with this resistor and then these two in parallel and then a capacitive voltage divider with this capacitor and then these three, this one, this one, and this one. Now when capacitor voltage divider equals the resistive voltage divider, you get a perfect replica of your signal. So if you were to put a square wave in here, you'd actually get a square wave out. And that's what's shown here. And there's a little test pin on the oscilloscope face where it creates this waveform and you can just see whether your probe has been properly balanced or perhaps that it's drifted over time since the last time you used it or someone else used it. What would happen if this wasn't balanced? Well, suppose that the capacitive voltage divider were greater than the resistive voltage divider. On the rising and falling edges, you get a very large current going through capacitors because they respond to the derivative of voltage. and They dominate the uh, two dividers. And so if the capacitive voltage divider is greater than the resistive voltage divider, you actually get a little bit of a cusp on the end. The resistive voltage divider is really what's going on over here when the waveform is basically a DC source. And so this would be a smaller voltage divider than this because the capacitors look like open circuits to DC. You get this kind of a cusping on the edges. This is called overcompensating. You could also go the other way where the capacitive voltage divider is smaller than the resistive voltage divider. And you get these kind of rounded edges. Both of these are artifacts of the measurement probe itself and not the circuit or the response of the circuit. So you have to be very careful that we don't change the thing that we're measuring. So we'll always check our probes at the beginning of every experiment, make sure that they are balanced properly. This is like 203. Um, each lab, at least most labs, have a dual purpose. One is to teach some concepts that are either in the 302 course uh, or other courses that you may have taken, and then measurement techniques. In this particular case we covered equivalent circuits of an oscilloscope, but also we'll talk about the function generator and the digital multimeter more in the experiment too. We looked at using a balanced bridge to compensate for actually the straight capacitance of the cable. And then lastly, the accuracy of the components and instruments. So we'll talk some more about oscilloscope accuracy in the actual experiment itself. And then as far as the techniques go, we're going to measure voltage, amplitude, and time using a scope. We're going to learn how to balance the probe again. And then take measurements of resistors, including small-valued resistors. And this is going to be lab number one.